What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome, bike, to the channel. Welcome, bike, to the headquarters. My name is Nicholas. This is BDGE. Big dogs got to eat fantasy football. It is Monday. Q&A Monday, where I'm answering y'all's questions. Fantasy, football, life, love, liberty, and pursuit of trappiness. Anything you throw my way, I will do my best to satisfy your needs. Y'all can drop your questions to me on Discord. BDGE has their own Discord channel. We are almost 3,000 homies deep, homies and homets. I don't know if there are any women in there. You could join Discord through Patreon. It is now behind a paywall on Patreon. So if you've been trying and there's been expired links, listen, we gave you three months and 3,000 people to get in there. You didn't do it. That's on you. If you're in the Discord, you could DM me and ask me a question on there at any time. Otherwise, patreon.com slash BDGE to sign up. I'm ready to answer some questions. So tuck your shirts in. Stop yelling. Let's eat. Question numero uno comes in from Jazz112. What's the most tilting statistic, good or bad, that either makes you want a certain player more than the others or stay away from for each position? Like, what is your go-to statistic to look at to determine who you want over another per position? Now, there are a whole lot of different things I take into account when I'm looking at drafting a player. It will never boil down to just one statistic it's like that uh it's like that saying it's not the will to win that matters everybody has that it's the will to prepare to win y'all can quote me on that it's like practicing all summer in the heat first game you lace them on months of prep rep after rep hour after hour of researching and researching that by the time you're on the field by the time you lace them up by the time you are at bat by the time you are on the clock in your draft it's not about the certain statistic it's not about the batting gloves you're wearing. It's muscle memory. So with that dumb fucking analogy aside, let's talk about some of my favorite numbers. I use a ton of different resources, all of which will be available in the Big Dogs draft guide, which goes live on Wednesday. My favorite websites, tools, apps, and resources for fantasy football. How to prep, how to research, how to find all the weird fucking numbers that I give to y'all will be listed in there in an exclusive article. In terms of tilting, any stat without context behind it is extremely dumb. Like when people cite raw fantasy numbers from the, the year prior over something like points per game, we always want to use numbers and statistics and analysis that is predictive. Because if we're using numbers that aren't predictive, you're telling me something that doesn't help us for the future. Like yards per carry for a running back takes absolutely no fucking context into the situation at hand. Offensive line play. Was it five offensive line versus nine guys in the box? And I absolutely hate. Okay, this one is tilting. When people cite just straight up yards per target, yards per reception numbers. Like for the last two years, we've heard nothing except for OJ Howard is the greatest tight end of all time because his yards per target numbers are really high. They're among some of the best in the NFL. Unfortunately, commanding targets in itself is a fucking talent that you need to be good at fantasy football. If you can't command targets, you making one nice play, one target a game, doesn't do shit for anybody. So some statistics do piss me off. What I look at in terms of individual statistics for success, a lot, of, a lot of times I look at coaching tendencies because I think they're as important, if not more so important in terms of like the volume that a player or a team will have pass versus run. So I love to use, this as one of the resources, one of the 20 or 25 resources that I have listed in the officially titled how to become the goat article in the draft guide. I look at sharp football stats, one of my favorite websites to look at like neutral game script play tendencies. So when a team is within the game's reach, trailing by fewer than six points or above by fewer than six points. So they're running their normal playbook. I like to see how a coach calls their plays. Are they run heavy? Are they pass heavy? I think that gleans a window into what the coach's normal game plan will be for a team. And you can kind of go based off that. But if we're looking at like predictive statistics, something that actually is pretty solid, and some of these are behind paywalls, uh, quarterbacks, the PFF passing grade. So Pro Football Focus does grades for each individual players. A lot of them are shit. But for quarterbacks, this has been really, really, really good at predicting successful quarterbacks coming from college, going to the NFL, as well as just the NFL grades and how they've performed over time. For running backs, I love to look at weight adjusted speed score, which you could find on player profile or basically 
just takes into account actual speed, long speed, taking into account your weight, along with a lot of other things like yards created, missed tackles forced per attempt. So I want to know elusiveness and you could find this on player profiler and their juke rate. You could find this on pro football focus. So I want to know outside of like those numbers, like yards per carry, how good is a running back in a neutral situation compared to every other running back in creating on his own outside of the offensive line? How good is this running back? That usually plays itself out over the long run from the receiving standpoint. I want to know running backs, like how many, how many routes they're running in individual game, right? Cause sometimes running backs will catch five passes, but they'll only run six routes. And if that's going to be the case going forward, the next time they run six routes next week, they're going to catch probably one pass, maybe get one target. So I think routes run is really important. That's going to be found on pro football focus, but that is also behind a paywall. I also want to know which you could find on sharp football stats, how often running backs are targeted in a certain offense. So you'd go to, I think volume and then passing target by position or target volume by position, whatever, some fucking thing up there. You'll be able to find it to where I like get these stats. Lamar Jackson only targets his running backs on 13% of his plays where the NFL average is 21%. So I like to get a feel for how often quarterbacks specifically target their running backs. So I think that helps breaking down expected volume in passing games for wide receivers. Yards per route run has been a very sticky stat in terms of like success for wide receivers in the NFL and in fantasy that is on pro football focus. I like to look at things like the catchable target rate, getting a ton of volume but your quarterback fucking stinks then your car your catchable target rate is going to be really low but that's not predictive because if you're playing with a new quarterback next year if the quarterback has a little bit more luck the following year the volume will probably still be there for that wide receiver but the efficiency and the production that they'll put up is going to be a lot higher um, i also like to look at like average depth of target yards after catch are you strictly like a volume play you know are you a slot wide receiver like jameson crowder who might get 125 targets but his yards per reception is 9.0 that means he's literally just a short volume player who doesn't make moves after the catch who's just not a good fantasy player and that's much like a running back who gets 250 carries in a season but averaging like four yards per carry that's not something that plays itself out well over the long run right eventually coaches are gonna make okay you're just super not efficient we need to stop running our offense through you and peel back there last thing i like to look at for wide receivers as well as as tight ends too percentage of routes run in the slot so i think one of the biggest mismatches in today's nfl for wide receivers specifically for fantasy is putting those bigger guys into the slot and letting them go against like the cornerback three or just a slot cornerback or a safety or a linebacker or whatever over the middle like Michael Thomas runs routes uh, from the slot at like 37 percent of his clips Allen Robinson's up at like 41 percent as well so those bigger guys they get put in the slot I like to see how often they're running routes from the slot because I think those are easy volume easy target easy reception formations for these wide receivers to get same thing with the tight ends yards per route run the volumes of routes run all together so the same thing i said with running backs before i want to know how involved they are in the passing offense how many routes they're actually running throughout the game so for like mark andrews who's only playing on you know 50 to 60 percent of the snaps overall he was still running a route on like 80 percent of the ravens plays so it was like an offensive thing where they didn't put him out there much for pass blocking duties or run blocking duties whatever it was but every time they were throwing the ball they would have andrews out there so you you need to be able to decipher the context behind a lot of the numbers when they're on the field what are they doing where are they running from i also like to look at like overall target share for tight ends and air yard share airyards.com is a free website that's really good for you guys where you could see the market share relative to your entire team each team is made up of 100 air yards or 100 targets right this will break down the percentage of like mark andrews had 27 percent of the air yards on the ravens last year mark andrews had 23 percent of the targets overall on the ravens last year so i like to see a high air yard share for tight ends to so let me know that they're not just also a volume play they're not just getting dink and dump passes they're someone who can make bigger longer plays downfield and are being targeted downfield that was a mouthful i hope some of those resources will help y'all i will link all the ones that i named down below in the description of the video so sharp football stats airyards.com all the free ones i'll i'll link down below anything paid will be behind a paywall so i'm not going to link it y'all can figure it out yourselves one of the best paid resources that i will link is the draft guide dropping on wednesday it will have that article with all my top favorite resources free paid website apps tools but it's also got our top sleepers list it's got our top bus lists the official do not draft list for 2020 it's got our rankings our top 250 big board ppr standard half ppr broken down by position super flex whatever you want it we got it and it's got our must draft players round by round the guys you cannot skip on in your drafts as well as dr morse's injury guide which i just installed into the guide this dude broke down like 92 players and made videos for every one of them big ass write-ups for their injury outlooks for 2020 as well as gave them an injury rating from one to ten going into the year this man put the work in and it is in the draft guide the easiest way for y'all to get it is to go to monkeyknifefight.com deposit ten dollars with the promo code bdge and play a game of two dollars on there you'll get an email
email from me later that day. That will give you $25 to play with a monkey knife fight. It will give you access to the season long guide that I'm talking about. Dr. Morse's injury guide and our rookie dynasty guide thrown in there for shits. 75 bucks worth of shit for $10. Monkeyknifefight.com. Use the promo code BDGE. When you deposit 10, play a $2 game on there. If you're in a state that's not eligible for monkey knife fight, just go to bigdogdraftguide.com and cop your shit. Question number two, Slim Shady. Is there a specific draft strategy to implement to have a competitive team this year, but draft with the possibility in mind that there could be no games this year? Yes. Yeah, so if there is no games this year, I, I can't imagine you'll have a competitive team this year. Uh, no, on a serious note, this is this has been on my mind. This has been my mindset for a while right now. We'll dive into the intricacies here. And I'm not really going to speak to specific individual players and, you know, how the disease will affect them, depending on like diseases and shit like that. We'll have Dr. Morse back on the channel mid-July to talk more about some of the injuries that have happened, like Debo Samuel, but also how COVID will affect players like, you know, Zeke long term and uh, what their on-field play will look like if they do develop Corona like midseason. I think that will be an important point to kind of touch on. But for now, this is the way I'm looking at the overall landscape of like football for 2020. I am very much of the mindset and I've been of the mindset for a while that the NFL will happen. The NCAA, however, will not. So this seems to be much more dynasty focused. With that in mind, I will be drafting my dynasty teams as I normally would. I will focus heavily, very heavily on youth at the beginning of drafts. When you do that, you give yourself flexibility in the middle to later round. So start drafting those win now guys, the veterans who might be off your team in a year, two years, even three years. If you start ripping off older guys right away, you immediately put yourself into win now mode. You use a couple of your first five picks on older players. You put yourself into win now mode immediately. Of course, you can start going with youth in the middle to later rounds but by that time you missed out on all the good use so when we're talking about specifically covid like this doesn't impact my strategy in a startup draft at all here are two of my recent teams and this is a super flex league tight end premium so it's typically ha it's a half ppr normal league but tight ends get full ppr in this so they get a nice 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 boost tight ends are pretty much like the wide receiver one to wide receiver three the top tight ends each year based on these stats. So my first five picks in this draft were Saquon, George Kittle, DJ Moore, DeAndre Swift, and I had to get a quarterback since it's super flex. So I drafted Kirk who got an extension. So the core of my team is very, very young, which gave me flexibility to start shooting for older players as the draft progressed. Julio dropped all the way to the 6'11 for me. So I got him to pair with DJ Moore, who's a young stud, obviously. I got Waller in the seventh round, who's a little bit older, but he's only been in the NFL for a little while now due to obviously his drug past. And this is a tight end premium. So I got him as a flex and a tight end too. Then a few more vets after that, Melvin Gordon at the end of the eighth round, Jarvis in the 11th round. And then my bench is just littered with young, high upside handcuff dart throws at running backs, some younger dude, then some veterans, Deshaun Jackson, Anthony Miller, Devin Duvernay, those guys at wide receivers, and then a whole shitload of tight ends, because again, this is tight end premium. So youth early on, COVID or not COVID, I don't give a fuck. That's how you got to shoot. And this is the other draft that I'm in the middle of where I think seven or eight rounds in. Also super flex. This is a full PPR league. Tight ends get 1.5 PPR. I absolutely fucking love this team so far. We have Miles Sanders, Chris Godwin, DeAndre Swift, Terry McLaurin, DJ Chark, Dish and Justice Chark, Daniel Jones, and Kirk Cousins as the second quarterback. I'm like two picks away. I'm praying that Darren Waller drops to me. I actually sent an offer to move up to try to get him. But as you could see, this is extremely youthful. Kirk Cousins is like the only veteran really I have on my team here. But I still think in a full PPR league, like I could probably compete for the playoffs right away. Okay, so enough about my teams. Youth first, Corona, no Corona. If you're trying to get into a dynasty startup league, another reason to join Patreon. When you join Patreon and then you join Discord through Patreon, you get access to the big dog startup leagues. We started over like 115 of them, $25 leagues, $50 leagues, $100 leagues, whatever you're trying to get into. If you've not dabbled with Dynasty yet, I would highly suggest getting into it because it's hella fucking fun. That's how you could do it. Patreon.com slash BDGE. So let's talk about the actual overview, the setup of this. College is, is where shit starts to get tricky because we're seeing the coronaviruses spike at a very massive rate with all these college kids getting back to their campuses and like working out together and whatever. We just saw like half the fucking Clemson team test positive for it. They're going to be positive tests this year. NFL, NCAA, whatever sports it is, whatever the fuck we're doing, that is that is just the fact. If we have a season or if we don't, there are going to be positive Corona tests. The difference I see here between the NFL and the NCAA is while both of them are businesses, only one of them has people working for them. Only one of them has employees which make the business go round. Only one of them has incentive to take these risks. If the NFL says they're playing, the players are going to play. If the NCAA says that, 
Who knows what these players do? I mean, you've already heard about the shit at UCLA with, you know, Chip Kelly's their head coach and the players. There was a report that the players want someone professional brought in to be monitoring the situation around coronavirus because they don't trust Chip Kelly to do the right thing if people start testing positive within their camp. Like, yes, you could say college players have an incentive, right? They their love of the game. I feel like they probably love their family's health a little more. And you could be like, oh, college players are playing for the NFL. That's also 0.2% of the college football population is preparing to go to the NFL. The rest of them ain't making the NFL. And as far as I know, I'm not, someone could fact check on me, fact check this on me, but I don't think people are going to lose their football scholarships if they don't have a football season. There's just far less at risk for the NCAA players to lose if they aren't the ones that play. So what does that mean realistically for Dynasty for 2021 picks? This is where I do think it makes a big impact. In my opinion, it greatly devalues rookie picks next year and the following year if the college football season does not happen. Like we've already seen the research, you know, guys like Graham Barfield, Mike Tagliari have, have jumped into this. And it, when it comes to rookie picks, it's basically a, a coin flip for you. Once you get past like the first five or six rookie picks, even the mid to late half of the first half or the first round of rookie picks, it's a coin flip for you to hit on those guys. And the percentages gets it gets worse and worse and worse as you move down the rounds. So let me explain. It's not that it's not that there's going to be a different number of great players entering the NFL next year, but our likelihood, our accuracy in predicting which guys are the right guys to be drafting at those valuable rookie picks is going to be terrible. It's already bad, but it's only going to get worse. And I say that for a few reasons. Like so much changes in the course of a year when it comes to the NCAA landscape and prospects and their NFL draft rating and their statistics and the production that they put up. A lot of these players are going to be different athletes and they're going to be different people altogether by the time next year's draft rolls around, assuming there is no college football. So if there is, you don't have to worry about anything I'm saying. I'm just talking about if there is no college football, this is the way I'm going to be looking at it. This is like a very pivotal time in a, a young male's life, right? When they're going through college at seven to 21 year old age for growing up both maturity wise and physically most importantly you're going from you know freshman in college we're just playing in high school to a year or two later playing against grown-ass fucking men doing football professionally this also what, what, what the underlying fact is the research that we do for rookie drafts and dynasty drafts is extremely heavily focused on the production that we have from these players in college for wide receivers breakout age is enormously important we are not going to have that data for an entire year. So we're going to have no idea whether or not a player broke out or didn't break out or landed somewhere in the middle or became the alpha on their team. If the NCAA football season didn't happen last year, we wouldn't know John Jonathan Taylor is any good at catching footballs. We wouldn't know that Joe Burrow even exists. So there are an, a ton of underlying concerns, in my opinion, for these future rookie picks, at least for the next like year or two years until we can start getting a more concrete baseline for these, these statistics that we tend to look at for predictive measures. So they, they worry me. I would try to get rid of them, to be honest with you, if, if you're concerned about the NCAA season happening. So I'm going to act as if picks are devalued. And again, this is not that there's going to be fewer good players. The same amount of players are going to be going into the NFL draft and the same amount of talented players are going to be going in. But the fact that we have one less year of production, the fact that we have one less year of knowing what's happening in these kids' lives and, and, and the NCAA season is going to make our accuracy picking which ones are the best and who should be at the top of rookie drafts really poor. Rookie drafts are are a messy, messy puzzle to begin with. And now part of the cover photo is basically torn off. Okay, okay, okay. Let's get to the last question. I know those first two were long-winded, so we're going to keep this last one to definitely not to a minimum. I'm probably about to yell for about 45 minutes, but this will be the last question of the day. If you've enjoyed the video so far, I would very much appreciate a little tap on the button that looks like this right below the video. It takes literally two seconds to scroll down and do that. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. We'll be breaking down more fantasy football stuff in depth Tuesdays and Thursdays. This is more just a random Q&A, but we, we dive deep into the big facts on the other days of Zivik. Nikolai514, what advice do you have for someone that wants to have a career in the fantasy football field like yourself? self where the fuck do i start first if you're looking to have a career in this field you just have to do it you just have to do it until you're doing it like if you want a job in the fantasy industry no one's going this is not like an entry-level business job no one's going to hand it to you no one's going to show up to your door or drop you an email and say like this position just opened up do you want it you literally have to make it for yourself so what i want you to do is like is, is close your eyes, close your, oh, woo, close your eyes. It scared the shit out of me. I don't know. I knew the mic was there and it still scared me. Close your eyes. 
and imagine ima- whatever it is that you imagine yourself doing within the industry. Picture exactly what it what it means to you to be full time in the fantasy industry. Open your eyes. Whatever you just pictured, you literally have to do that for free for a very, very, very long time, being very consistent with it for the chance at maybe making it into reality. If you want a job that 99.9% of people want, you have to be able to live in the delta of the 0.1% of the work ethic. Your work ethic has to be in that 0.1% of where the 99.9% of people want to be, but won't do the work to be. And it sounds shitty because it is. And you have to love what you're doing. If this is what you want to do, you have to make sure you love it. Otherwise, you will not put the work in. You also have to be very, very good, like very fucking good at what you're doing. Like just because you put the work in does not guarantee or promise you any sort of success here. So what does it take? One, it takes an unwavering work ethic. But again, that's the bare minimum. Everyone who wants to be here, wherever it is that you want to be, also has that work ethic. If you don't have that, you're already out of the race. You also need an unwavering belief in, in yourself and what you're doing, but I don't want that to get construed. You need this confidence within yourself, but this is not like a light switch that you can turn on and off. It's not like one day you could be like, okay, you know what? I'm just going to start being more confident in myself now. Like you have to have that or you just don't have it. Like I swear the first time I hit record on this camera, like six years ago, there was not a single fucking doubt in my mind that I would be where I am today. That being said though, like I want to be real with you. I want, I want to, I want to take you through what my day is today. It's I'm filming this on Sunday morning. So it's a Sunday morning. I work seven days a week, not because I have to, but because I want to. And I probably do actually have to. But I was up at 5 a.m. today, 5 a.m. on a Sunday. This video I had done no work on. So I needed to research the answers that I wanted to give to y'all. I needed to film this. I needed to edit it. That's what I've been doing from about five through eight, 830. Once I'm done filming, I'll edit it. I'll upload it. I'll do the thumbnail for it. And then I have to dive into the draft guide, which again, drops on Wednesday. There are multiple huge articles I need to finish. I need to do the top 250 rankings, half PPR, standard, full PPR. That will take hours of my day. Later tonight, myself and Mike are filming bunk bed breakdowns. I will have almost no time to myself today outside of this stuff. Maybe a few hours to sleep because Lord knows I fucking need it after waking up at 5 a.m. today. Maybe I'll work out within that time. You got to keep the fucking mind sharp. But again, it's Sunday. Not to be annoying, but I just want y'all to understand what goes into this, like for real, for real. And granted, granted, most people I understand don't have the ambition that I do or don't want to get to the heights that I want to get to. A lot of people would probably be happy just being a writer within the fantasy space. And I know I want more than that. So I'll work harder because I know that I need to work harder in order to get more for that. And you need to be self-aware of what it is, right? Going back to what you picture yourself doing. If it's anything like what I'm doing, the amount of work required is almost fucking nauseating. But on some practical shit, like the best advice I can give you is no matter what you're doing, no matter what platform you're providing value to your audience through, whether it's video, podcast, blogging, it's you have to be yourself no matter what. I'm talking about like the authenticity of being in the basement with your best friends the way that you speak with them, the way that you speak with whoever you're most comfortable with in the world is the way that you need to communicate with your audience. The way I talk to y'all through these videos is exactly how I talk to my mom, is exactly how I talk to my best friends, girls out on a date. It's exactly who I am no matter what the fuck I'm doing. And it's why you guys relate to me. There's already so much info and numbers and stats out there in this space, in the fantasy world today, that over the long run, the only way you're gonna separate yourself is is by branding. And by branding, branding is just the story of, of your brand or who you are. Branding is just the story of who you are as a person. The only way you tell who you are as a person is literally just by fucking being you. Over the next few years, right? You're you're asking this question, so you're just very, very much getting started. You haven't even started yet, I'm assuming, and I've probably already scared you the fuck off. But over the next five years, there are gonna be another 10, 20, 30,000 fantasy writers that try to break through in the industry and won't be able to. It's an extremely saturated market. And unless you can, can connect to your audience on a real human level, and this is just way outside of fantasy, but doing anything marketing wise, if you can't connect on a real human level, you're just not going to win in today's world. You're going to see a lot of companies and we've already seen it in like the DFS space, DFS for sure, their tools and stuff. They only focus on numbers and algorithms and shit, never branding. And they're all going to go out of business. New ones will pop up. The ones who actually have a couple good personal brands that keep them afloat might stay afloat for a while, but it's going to be a fun three to five years 
for our brand. And you see a lot of these com- over the last like few weeks, we've seen a lot of these like fantasy football dream team companies come together and start plucking up all the writers and stuff from all over Twitter. I don't know if you guys are active on Twitter, but you have like Fade the Noise, Brad Evans's company. They plucked up like 15 guys. Uh, Pro Football Focus has hired like 15 dudes. You have fantasy points from from Graham Barfield, Scott Barrett, and a, a bunch of those guys. They're all putting together like the dream team because they think that piling names on top of numbers, on top of stats, on top of tools is what's going to separate them, but it's not. This shit right here, like literally this video, this talk I'm having with you guys probably helps you relate to me more than like 99% of the shit that you've listened to from a different podcaster for like the last three years. So be yourself, learn to be fucking resourceful. If you need to figure something out, like you don't know how to start. How do I record a video? Google that shit. Use Google, use YouTube. They're your best friends. There are literally, if you need to learn how to fucking edit a video, go on Google, how to edit a video on the MacBook. There will be 1,000 billion, 400 quadrillion results that pop up within 0.2 0.2 seconds. You're fucking doomed. If you want a weird job, if you want a fucking awesome job, you have to be able to live on the other side of that spectrum doing shit that's not awesome, doing shit that sucks in order to get there because people who want the awesome job need to be willing to work harder than the people that aren't willing to work hard to get there. If awesome jobs are easy to have, everybody will fucking have them. So start. Understand that you have to give value to your audience. Understand that you have to be 100% authentic to who you are. That is how you relate to your audience. Don't worry about the number of people that you follow. Worry about the depth that you have with those followers. It is always depth over with. It's depth over with people. So uh, if you want more stuff like this, guys, I've basically documented most of my life for the last like four or five years. If you go on YouTube over to my playlist section on my YouTube I have a playlist called vlogs. I have videotaped most of my life since I was like 23 years old when I left my last full-time job. And I have videotaped everything that has gone on behind the scenes of the brand and my business and who I am as a person from content creation to business dealings and how I felt going through it all. So those are easily the best business resources that I've put out and made available to y'all because they're very business centric because my life is, this is my livelihood. Like my life revolves around doing this shit for you guys. So I would go check those out. Uh, Also the new podcast that I launched a couple weeks ago why yelling you could find in apple podcast spotify watermelon pie Pie, Pie, all the podcast networks that is also pretty business centric too so if you're interested in this kind of content i would go follow why yelling on the itunes store and i would just go watch some of my vlogs man i really think those are some of the most helpful business assets that i've put out for sure so that's all we got on tap for the q a today i hope you guys enjoy this one i actually enjoyed making this one a little bit it was uh, a little bit deeper got into the feels a little bit If y'all enjoyed, let me know in the comment section down below. Hit that thumbs up button if you did. So subscribe to the channel if you want some real, real fantasy. Good, good. Later on in this week. And the best way to support the brand, monkeyknifefight.com. Use the promo code BDGE when you deposit 10 buckers. Play a game on there of $2. And I will email you access to all of the draft guides we have. As well as you get the $25 to play with a monkey knife fight. Which will flip into $2,500 come NFL season. I'm out. I'll see y'all tomorrow. Love you. Peace.